Good afternoon. It is wonderful to see everyone, those of us here in Zoom, those of us who are watching on all our other platforms. While our topic is the poetry of Natan Alterman with Rachel Korazim, who I think is truly the greatest teacher of Israeli poetry that is out there, um, the reality of having a teacher teach from Israel in a time of conflict is gives me chills um, just to think about. And so first and foremost, Rachel, we pray for the safety of you and your family and the country and that peace is found in the region soon and in our time. It was, I think, just uh, two hours after our session last week that you went into your shelter for the um, first time. Um, and so we are very much with you in spirit and at heart, but not knowing what it is like day to day, minute to minute on the ground. And so we've great appreciation. Um, Rachel is a bulldog and and there was no canceling this or um, doing anything. She'll explain actually what um, will happen if there's a siren. So Rachel, I'm gonna hand things over to you so we don't waste any more time. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much uh, <clears throat> Rabbi Jessica for the introduction. And I have noticed that the recording was paused and I'm wondering if that is intentional or do you want to make sure that this session is recorded? We're recording on, on the live streaming service. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Just checking because it had happened in my life that I forgot to record and then we can also it. record here. It's okay. Okay. I don't care as long as you're doing what you need to do. Uh, and this, thank God, is not my responsibility. So uh, thank you, everybody. And it's still very early afternoon for you. And we are getting ready for sunset here. So when asked these days how I am, I say as well as one can be. Physically, Yossi and I are a really privileged people. We do live in the community of Jaffa, which had suffered its own share of local disturbances between Arab and Jewish citizens. I will not go into the details of what is happening because watching the international media, you get more than a fair share of horror, atrocity, fire, violence. What I want you to know that there is an uncountable number of grassroots organizations that are making a point of reaching out to each other, of meeting, of organizing either on the professional level, a, such as social workers, health workers that will get out together, Jews and Arabs, to speak to these things, simple neighborly things a, that one does, and I don't need to enumerate what it is that Yossi and I are choosing to do that is part of our everyday life in Jaffa. Just to give you a last minute thing, because a lot is happening on the social media, and I'm sure you are aware of that as well, and how much viciousness can happen on the social media and yet how much good can happen there. So here is a little dose and this could not reach you yet because it happened exactly five minutes ago, just as I was waiting to be invited into the class. So today, Arab citizens of the state of Israel, I repeat, Arab citizens of the state of Israel are on strike. Peaceful, demonstration of not showing up at work, or if they are necessary workers like medical workers, taking an hour and showing their solidarity with their brethren across the border where over 200 people out of whom so many children have been killed in these activities, also within Israel, also demonstrating again any sort of violence within the civilian population. One of our cell phone companies published on Facebook a couple of lines of support of its Arab workers in their plight and pain for their brethren across the border. And there was immediately a wave of people calling to boycott that particular telephone company because of the support. So am I safe? Yes. Am I well? No. 
as I said, we are privileged. We have a safe room within our apartment. Should something happen and let's go into that, should the sirens sound on or off, whatever you want to call it, when you hear the siren, you will hear it because my mic is open. I have a safe room within the apartment. It's exactly five steps from where I'm sitting. And in Tel Aviv, we get 90 seconds of warning, which is way more than the majority of the population of the state of Israel living in the southern part of the country. And our safe room is ready with comfortable pillows and whatever for us to sit, sit or stretch on. There are bottles of water there, everything we need. So we just go in there, Yossi and I, and the instructions are that 10 minutes after the last siren, you can come out of your safe room. We normally also hear either the Iron Dome interception or God forbid, if there is a hit, a, they are, thank God, much rarer than the Iron Dome interceptions. So if, should a thing like that happen in the middle of our class, my suggestion is for Rabbi Jessica to take over. I will walk into my safe room and we can, you can continue the conversation and I will be back as soon as the 10 minutes are over. Should this happen less than short 10 minutes before the end of class, I will use 60 seconds out of the 90 that I have to conclude the class, to say goodbye to you, and I will walk into my safe room. Is that okay? Can you, can you, do you have a choice? No. <laughs> so so uh, it has to be okay. Normally when I know that there are many more people than I can see on the screen right now, I'm aware of the other modes of screening and sharing. And yet I will ask whether through the chat or by quickly raising a hand, because we are few here, if since last time, I do that always when I have a small class. I don't do that in the 200 plus people <laughs> class, but uh, welcome Yosefa. So, but when we have a small class, my custom, my minhag is to start the class by saying, was there something that happened in your thinking since last week? A thought, a question, an insight that you would like me to react to or you would like to share with others. So you can raise your hand digitally or just your hand in front of your mic and I will give you a minute or two so should you want to share that. Okay. I will consider that all of you are caring and praying and thinking about me. So don't interrupt the class just to tell me that, okay? I know that you all are. Thank you. Now, Judy, go ahead. Yes, in the first session, you mentioned that Nathan Altman referred to the Jewish homeland and not Israel. The state of the Jews, yeah. Yeah, and you said you would explain that later. And I did. Oh, I must have missed it. I have okay, it. let me continue. So the, the key, the secret uh, was in the dates. We were looking at, oh. a, a, at the date when the poem was composed. And anything that happened before May 14th, 1948, which is when Ben-Gurion declares the state and names it, he, Medinat Yisrael, it is the state of Israel. Uh, before that, nobody knows the name. Okay. Now, if you, and then Altman went to the second best choice and he took the title of Herzl book, Judenstadt, the state of the Jews, and he had used that. So short of the Ben-Gurion official naming, he no. took the second best, the Herzl, long dead by the time the poem is written, and chose his name. Does that answer the question? Yes, now I remember you explaining it. Okay, Sorry. in the same way, you may remember that in the poem preceding Silver Platter, Vayhi Erev, and there was evening, he refers to Hanukkah as the holiday of sovereignty and freedom. And again, I said, short of having day of independence, which we, you only have after May 14th, 1948, since the poem is of December 47, he still refers to Hanukkah 
as the holiday in which Jews in the land of Israel marked in the way of the Maccabees their hope for upcoming sovereignty. So ah. this is one of the reasons that if I can show you how to read the very close reading of Altaman, you can find clues and keys and references to the exact day. And the beauty of that is when we discuss poetry in general, we say, well, the book was published in such and such year. But when you deal with this particular body of poetry, the seventh column, the, the Alterman poetry that relates to contemporary events, it's different. You do not look at the date of publication of the book because all these poems were published in the daily newspaper. And the first thing you want to check is the date it was published. And I don't know that you can take advantage of that, Judy, because I don't know your level of Ivrit. But uh, every Thursday at a, exactly this time, I run a class that is now over a year studying nothing but Altaman. And if you check your screens right now in the gallery view, you will see a person called Yosef Aziv. She is a Hebrew speaker and she participates in this class for over a year now. And when we do a poem from the Silver Seventh Column, I will show them because there are, the, the, there is an internet site that has historical newspapers. And I will show them what was published in the paper the week before or the day before that made Alterman write this poem, okay? So this is the beauty of the thing. You need a solid Hebrew for that. And thank you for, thank you, Judy, for giving me the opportunity to address this. And I'm gonna mute you now so that we can start class. But this is the type, exactly the type of questions that invites a deeper understanding of the process we are looking at because we are reading poetry, but it's a little bit of an excuse, the reading of the poetry. It's to learn about certain aspects of Israeli society, of the state of Israel uh, that are not here. So I keep wondering at Yosefa coming back for this class when we studied this poem in the Hebrew class, but I have a suspicion and the feeling of she and maybe others because of the events of the day want to come and study this particular poem. And I am going to start right ahead and explain why people who studied this poem with me even more than once will be here in class. So uh, you can see obviously the picture of Altaman. I keep bringing it up with the dates of his birth and his passing. Uh, and this is still uh, something, oi, am I in my, uh, yes, all right. So the War of Independence, 1948, and I put right to it the word Nakba. Now this in itself would be judged very critically by many of my Israeli and maybe Jewish friends living outside of Israel. Because when we call Milchemet HaShichror, Milchemet HaAzmaud, the War of Independence of the State of Israel, that happens in 1948-1949, Palestinians call it the Nakba. Officially in Israel, organizations or institutes that mark the Nakba as a day of mourning for them because of their terrible losses can lose state funding. Israeli kids will not hear, Jewish kids, will not hear the word Nakba mentioned in their schools unless they happen to go to a school that encourages this type of multiple narrative learning. So me, already by choosing to include the word Nakba in the title of our class of our class today, I have tagged myself politically. You know exactly, had you not known before, okay? If you just met me for the first time. But the mere choice of one word, I'm tagged, I'm known, known. 
that I'm a person who believes that by not giving up even a bit of how important the state of Israel is for the Jewish people, this does not take away from our obligation to listen to the narrative of 20% of the population of Israel, the Arab citizens of the state of Israel, who stayed here while 750,000 of their brother and family members, et cetera, left, were made to leave, were encouraged to leave different means. We are not going into that. Why am I choosing to do that in my title? And why am I spending so much time on my title? Because Eitelman, by writing the poem that we are going to look at in a minute, exactly paying attention, exact attention to the date, had said, we need to do better than we are doing. There are things that we do to the Arab population that we are now in the midst of the war that we call the war of independence and the word Nakba does not yet exist at the time. Alterman is not using it. We need to be more attentive. We need to be more careful. We need to do better than we are doing. Why did I put the subtitle? There never was a silence that needed to be broken because Israel for the last over 10 years has now an organization called Breaking the Silence, Shuvrim Shtika. And many other Israelis as well as Jews outside of Israel and maybe non-Jews as well, object to the, activity of, the activities of this organization. Why do they do that? Because this is an organization that encourages soldiers after they finished their military service. I repeat, these are not soldiers who betrayed the state of Israel. These are not soldiers who even used the right for conscientious objection. They believed in the need to defend the country. They believed in the need to stop terrorism. They do a full military service. And yet when they are discharged and not a minute before, they give testimony to events that were not right to things that they so witnessed or even were part of that should not have happened. And this is why they call it breaking the silence because while you are a soldier, you are not supposed to address yourself to these issues outside of the military. Once your service is over, you sort of break the silence. So why Rachel Korozim are you choosing a title there never was a silence that needed to be broken? because what I wanted to bring to the knowledge of people who so object the activities of breaking the silence, which I, let me admit again, now that I have tagged myself, I support. I buy the books of breaking the silence. I go to their events. I want to listen and learn. Why did I choose this title? Because I want people to be aware of the fact that way before the parents of the soldiers of breaking the silence were born, Alterman already broke the silence. So the title for this session and others that I teach that include early Israeli, Hebrew, Jewish articulations of critique against actions of the IDF from within. Should I repeat for the third time, not people who ran away, not people who left, not people who betrayed the state, loyal citizens of the state of Israel who speak out. So therefore the title of my session is, there never was a silence that needed to be broken. Uh, let me check very quickly if there is a question or a comment up till this moment. Uh, Jessica, will you indicate that to me if you see anything in the chat or something that I need to address myself to? I, I don't see anything do right not. now. Then I don't... let us continue. I wanted to start, and I hope without having prepared you, Rabbi, by saying part of the blessing that we do on Shabbat and other days when we read the Haftarah that part of Tanakh that is read after we finish the reading of Torah and put the Torah down and then we take the books of the prophets. And before that happens, 
a blessing is said. I'm going to read part of it. I have put one of the many translations on the screen. And is it okay if I ask you, Rabbi, to read the English? Can you see it on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Bracha. I, bef- br- yeah. Okay, so bracha. Bracha. Quickly- Sorry. Right, let's go. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר בחר בנביאים טובים ורצה בנבריהם הנאמרים באמת. ברוך אתה אדוני הבוחר בתורה ומשה עבדו וישראל עמו ובנביאי האמת והצדק. ברכה before the reading of Haftarah. You are praised Adonai our God, ruler of the universe, who has chosen devoted prophets and was pleased with their words uttered with truth. You are praised Adonai who chooses the Torah, Moses your servant, Israel your people, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. So for thousands of years, at least once a week, we as a congregation and every one of our younger people who comes into mitzvot on a bar or bat mitzvah, no matter what age they choose to do that, And when the reading of Haftarah takes place, they will give blessing and thanks to God for having chosen good prophets and welcomed their words said in truth. Now, I'd like to ask you, because you know I'm aging, so I may have forgotten. Did you ever hear of one single prophet that was actually praising the people of Israel? Did you ever hear one single prophet who has nothing but good to say about the kings of Israel? Because if you did, I indeed need that learning in, in my life because I have never. By including this part in the blessing of the Haftarah, what our sages of millennia of years before us have taught us is to welcome critique to thank God for the ability to criticize because this is what the prophets are doing. And since we do not live days of prophets anymore, there are sometimes when we are prophet, uh, fortunate enough, one of our poets will step into the huge shoes of our prophets and will say the words of criticism in truth being chosen to do that in whatever process of choosing we believe in. The poem we are reading is called Alzot. And Alzot, I haven't translated, you see what I've done. I just gave you a transliteration and a picture of the only thing that was left of the village that this poem was written about. And it was written in the year 1948 we will go into the details. I'd like you to just remember the sound of the words alzot, which mean because of that, for that. It's simple, just two syllables, alzot, because of that, for that. Let us look now, again, I need support so that you believe me. So I want to introduce you to Judge Menachem Finkelstein, who used to be, until about 10 years ago, the military advocate general. Would you suspect such a person as of a traitor to the cause of Israel? I hope you don't think so. He is now a, a judge in the courthouse in the town of Lod, mind you, where many of the disturbances are happening. It's a regional courthouse of which he is the president right now. In the year 2011, exactly 10 years ago, when he finished his service to the armed forces, he published a book. And the title of the book is The Seventh Column and the Purity of Arms. This is the term we use in Hebrew to what you call a war ethics that your arms need to be pure, okay? Nathan Altraman about security, ethics, and justice. This is the book Judge Menachem Finkelstein has written, not me, I just read it. And those of you who have any Hebrew, 
and Rabbi, I trust you do. Can you see the cover page of his book and what is the poem that he put on the cover page of Al, his book? Azot. Azot. Right. This is the poem we are studying. Now, this is not a reaction from the year the poem was written. This is a studied scholarly juridic study of the importance of the poetry of Nathan Alterman to the configuration and articulation of the notions of security, ethics, and justice, as can be seen in his seventh column. And when Judge Menachem Finkelstein is publishing this book, he chooses to put on the cover page two, the first two verses of the poem I was studying. I hope this again is justification enough for my choice by not tagging me as a traitor to the state. Another document that I want, as if we are in a court, you know, I'm bringing documents to protect myself, to show my case. You can see in the middle of this poem, actually the person with the white shirt, that is Nathan Altman. He is sitting with many, many other guys. And then on the right-hand side of the picture, with his face to the left, you can see a guy with spectacles. This is actually Commander Yitzhak Sadeh, who was at the head of the Palmach. Palmach was the combat unit of the Haganah, the pre-state military force. And as soon as we have the IDF, Yitzhak Sadeh becomes the, commanders of, the commander of the Southern Command. He was a sort of what we call a poet for the drawer, writing poetry in secret and not publishing it. But he was a good friend of Nathan Alterman. He uh, showed his, him many of his poems to get the poet's reaction to it. It is thought by many that after the events that brought Alterman to write the poem Alzot, since he was not in the military at the time, that his source of information could have been, must have been Yitzhak Sadeh, okay? Who could not as a general under oath in the military say these things, but he found a venue. So this is why we normally, when we teach this poem, uh, we, we show this picture. Quick timeline again. So Israel's War of Independence timeline. UN partition plan, we discussed it last week. Uh, the State of Israel declared on May 14th, 1948. And in between that phase of the war when the Brits are still here, and therefore we still call it the Civil War. And uh, the fall of Gush Etzion just a night before the state is declared. And then the three phases of the War of Independence. It's not a history class. It's not a military history class. But I want you to know that the War of Independence of the State of Israel, related by Arab Israelis and other Palestinians as the Nakba, was not an ongoing non-stop war, but it had different phases. The, uh, and then truces in between normally. And now there are poems and songs that we are going to relate to. So one of them is a song called The Sands and Foxes. I gave you the date of publication. And then a military operation for a conquering a part of the country. A, again, making sure that the Arab population would leave in fear in most cases. So this is operation you have in the south. Our commander that we met, Yitzhak Sadeh, is the commander in chief of that. And then we have a Operation Dani Leda. If you happen to about five or six years ago, when this was popular to read Ari Shavit's book, My Promised Land, then it had a chapter about the conquering of Leda. Many people thought that Alterman wrote his poem about the events in Leda, also atrocious, but now we know that it was about Alduime in October of uh, that year. So I put it in and here is the publication of Alzot, the poem following by three weeks, the event 
that the poem relates to. And so we can calculate that this is probably the time that Yitzhak Sadeh took to make the decision to speak to Alterman, maybe a little bit less, because how else would he know the military is not publicizing this event? And what I need for you to see that the poem is published on November 19th, 1948, and immediately two days later, there is the Ben-Gurion reaction. So we are in already into the state because this is November 1948. The state was declared in May. And so Ben-Gurion is not only the head of the state, the prime minister, he is also the minister of defense. He also happens to be the head of the ruling party, which is a Mapai, the Labour Party. A, the paper Altman works for is the daily paper of that party. So if you want to speak sort of metaphorically, among his other many other positions, Ben-Gurion is also in a certain way Alterman's boss, right? <laughs> because Alterman works for the paper, which is the party organ of the party at the head of which is Ben-Gurion, who is now the prime minister and the minister of defense. Lots of responsibilities beyond being the boss of Alterman. But we, we want to say that as well. Having done that, quick check if there is a question, just jump in if this is not clear. And I will repeat my offer as I often do. If there are among you teachers or other people who would like to go back to this chart, I can send the PowerPoint to Rabbi Jessica. Actually, you have it. I have sent it to you. And you are more than welcome to share it with other people should they be interested. And now we are looking at four gentlemen, I'm sorry, this was not gender equal at the time, who are involved. So one is David Ben-Gurion, who is the head of state and the minister of defense. To his left is Yitzhak Sadeh, the commander who is in charge of the military that will execute the activities about which Alterman has a severe critique. Alterman, you know, and Uri Avneri at the time is a very nationalistic right-wing young person, 20 some years of age, who writes the lyrics of a very popular pro the military and the fighting, etc., a song that has an echo in the Alterman poll. So I have brought him in as well. Uri Avneri later in life becomes one of the fiercest fighters and workers for peace uh, in Israel through his journalistic activities, meetings with Yasser Arafat way before any of our leaders or yours thought of meeting with him or inviting him to the White House or what have you, okay? So here are these four gentlemen who are somehow connected to that that we are talking about. And here is the, here is the poem. Here is our text. So the Hebrew on the right hand side, as you can see, uh, the English is on the left where it belongs. And we are looking at both. And I'd like you to see now in the translation. This is a translation that I have done because very little of Alterman's work is translated into English. And so if you see reasons to suggest how to make this better, please, by all means. Alterman also has a motto to his poem. We will read it very shortly. But what I want you to see that I kept here the Hebrew title, but in the English translation, I already gave you not just the transliteration, but the meaning for this. So on these very days of battle, the Minister of Defense has noticed these things and had added to what is said here, his own authority. This deed that is not very common in matters of war is worth the weight of any poem from the point of view of its effectiveness as well as morality. So- Rachel, is, can, I, can, I, can I just say something quick? Sure. The, I think, I resonate with this as a rabbi because when we write sermons, there's subtle things that we notice or do divrei Torah that like no one cares about, but for us, it makes a sermon. And I resonate with that tremendously. Okay, so thank you. 
you will, you will see immediately some biblical quotes, etc. I'm just watching the watch. I took so much time for uh, the contemporary affairs so that I will need to continue. So what's interesting, of course, that Ben-Gurion could not have written and added his opinion to the poem before the poem was published. So this was not published in the paper on the day the poem was published. This, this comes later in the books. What I need for you to see is the word alzot on the Hebrew right-hand side highlighted and the English for this. And I will click this and I will take you to what we often see, the biblical sources. So just look at the accumulation. And Jessica, you will find it in my source sheets. A few of the many times, alzot chigru sakim, oh, haven't be astonished about this. And because of this, gird yourself with sackcloth. Alzot te'eval aretz, for this shall the earth mourn, etc., etc. Why am I bringing you this? Because the Israeli readership of Alterman, whether they are observant or not, they know their biblical lore. This is a truism about Israelis. Our fluency in biblical lore is not connected to our level of observance. I need a whole other class to explain that. So, but anyway, it's a fact, just accept it for today. So I want you to understand that when the Hebrew reader sees the words alzot, and they can remember even if just a few of this, then they know that this not gonna be good. That whenever the expression alzot is mentioned in the Bible, is in the way of reprimand. It's in the way of bringing to knowledge something that needs to be mourned, something that needs to be angry about. So Ataman is actually talking to his audience and to his readership in codes. As soon as they see the title, they know this is not going to be a light thing to read. Alterman is mad. Alterman is angry, and we better prepare. Okay, let's continue. I'm only with the first stanza, but set your mind at ease. I'm not going to spend as much time with every single stanza, just the first verse. So we had that, and now we come mounted on a jeep. He had crossed the conquered city. So we are going to see a description of a young person and the way the poet relates to this person. I just highlighted the English because the Hebrew was too small. A chatsa alei jeep eta irakvusha, mounted on a jeep, he had crossed the conquered city. And I wanted for you to see this because no way you can know that hmm, at the time there is a very well-known popular song called Samson's Foxes. It's about a military unit that comes under our commander that we met a few minutes ago, it's Haksade, And they are riding their Jeeps and they are conquering the land. Just look at the text four by four on the racing Jeep, song soaring from the heart, the path underneath dances and chants the path leading to our foes. And then they are called Samson foxes, lose again all over the region. They carry the torch at night. So just in case you forgot, ladies and gentlemen, Samson's story was about collecting hundreds of foxes, lighting their tails and setting them free in the fields of the Philistines, okay? This is what we glorify Samson for so much. Would you like to judge this from the point of view of war ethic? To take the livelihood of all the Philistine population by burning their bread, their fields, creating starvation? And how do you feel about brave Israeli soldiers 2000 years later who choose these themes as their anathem, 
we are like Samson foxes. We will set fire to the foe and the enemy again. Obviously, Nathan Altman is not very happy with this poem because he starts the poem for which he gave the title Alzot. He starts it by describing these very proud young people mounted on a jeep, smiling and happy. We are still with the first verse. And now we read the whole of the first verse. So mounted on a jeep, he had crossed the conquered city, a brave and a gentle lad, a lion of a lad in the street that was beat. An old man and a woman were pressed to the wall all they had. So this is the glorious Jewish young IDF entering an Arab town on their jeeps. And there is a woman and there is an old man and the alleys of the town must be very narrow. And they are afraid of the jeeps probably driving very fast, maybe shooting. So what do they have? They are pressed to the wall. Now, what I'm going to do for you is just show you that many, many years before, Shaul Chernikhovsky writes a poem about the wondrous wall in the city of Worms. And he recaps a legend about Rashi's mother. It's a beautiful poem. It's in your sources that when the Crusaders come back, you know, it's the beginning of the 11th century to Germany and they rush through the cities and Rashi's mother is pregnant with Rashi, the great biblical commentator, and she is afraid of the troops. So she presses herself to the wall. And then there is this legend about how the wall opened in the shape of her body to protect her against these warriors. By the way, I'm very proud to tell you that this picture that you see of the wall that is taken this, you know, I don't know how to call it, this shape to protect the belly of a pregnant woman. This is a picture I took because I visited this place and this is the legend that is told about this wall. And when Chernikhovsky writes this poem, it's already the beginning of the rise of the Nazis to power. So he will conclude it thus many years ago when evil and robbery flourished, villains ruled, wicked regime and strong men. Had this happened in our days, not even a stone would budge. So Chernikhovsky already, when he is writing this in the late 20s, he is lamenting the fact that maybe a wall would open to this struggling woman back in the Middle Ages, not today, by the way, not late 20s, but 1924. When Alterman is bringing this poem to the attention of his audience, how can he be so sure that they would know what he is talking about? I'll tell you how, because this is how I immediately thought about it. Because the poem about the miraculous wall in Worms is something that Israeli high school kids studied for matriculation at the time. So a whole generation, maybe two, knows this poem. Some of us even were asked by our teachers to commit parts of it to memory. So when Alterman is calling upon the Bible in the term Alzot, when Alterman is sort of lighting up the image of these brave guys on their jeeps, and when he is calling to mind the famous miraculous salvation of Rashi and his mother, he knows that his audience is with him. It is with all this preparation that we come to the reading of the poem only in English today for brevity. Mounted on a jeep, he had crossed the conquered city, a brave and a gentle lad, a lion of a lad. 
in the street that was beat, an old man and a woman were pressed to the wall, all they had. And the lad then had smiled with milky white teeth. I will try the machine gun. And he did. Can you hear Alterman? Can you hear his criticism that making the gun function, shooting, was not even a necessity of war? That they just come into the civilian town and shoot at the civilian population because you can. I will try the machine gun. And he did, tried. The old man just shielded his face with bare hands and the wall was all covered with blood. This, and this is the whole description of the event. The Israeli military went into the town of Dwayme that had no resistance, no arms, just civilians, a small village, conquered it, shot. There is a debate. Even official Israeli sources say 80 civilians, Palestinian so sources say 90. Does it matter? IDF recognizes 80. Israeli historians recognize 80. And now Alterman, after having given the description, starts commenting. The snapshots of liberty battles so dear, they are braver than those so they hiss. Our war thus requires a poetic ear very well. Let us sing for this. If you expect me to glorify the great soldiers, you will need to listen to this. And this is when Alterman finally uncovers the title of the poem within the poem. I'm going to sing of Alzot, the things that need to be criticized. Let us therefore now think of delicate cases that are better of called simply slaying. Don't whitewash, don't launder your language. This is not a delicate case. It's slaying, call it by its name. Let us think of the tongues that disguise all the traces of guilt about lads simply playing. Can you hear all those people? Well, they didn't know any better. They were just new trainees. So they tried how strong they can be. And it's not so important to speak about these things. We can hush them a little bit. Let us not simply say these are but minor details. For details and principles are always wed. Don't tell me it's just a minute event, just a detail. No, details might reflect values and principles. If the public just listens to details that's told and does not imprison the criminal heads. Ladies and gentlemen, the national poet of the state of Israel in the first five months of its existence calls some of its military criminal. In 1948, and let me tell you, he was not fired. He called the thing by its name for the bearers of arms and with them we all. Don't tell yourself, rabbis, teachers, social workers, judges, that this happened in the army and therefore not your thing. For the bearers of arms and with them we as well. Altman is educating the young state that the military represents the civilian society. We are also responsible in either action or with a pat on the back are forced with the talk of revenge, so we tell. So you know they did this because previously they started and they, the Arabs, did something atrocious and therefore we revenged ourselves. No, no, says Alterman, don't give me that crap. 
This is not how we operate. The revenge is not a valid argument. This revenge turns into criminal deeds very black. The war is so cruel. He who morals expounds with a fist shall be torn from its face. Be but because this is so, the decency bounds should be straight and as hard as a mace. Just because we need our army to be strong, we need also for the decency of it to be as straight and as hard as a mace. And a mace is actually a weapon, is part of, you know, crusaders, military equipment, etc. Our arms need to be strong, and so does our decency. And to those who can sing only splendors of war and are bound to pour honey on its every sore, let it punish them cruelly so evermore and step them forwith on the martial court floor. Altaman is calling for a trial. Altaman is calling for calling the thing by its name. It's a war crime. It needs to be tried. They need to be court-martialed. Let the silent, the whispers, this is so, you know, uh, it, it happens. Be smitten and dare not show its face. And now you can imagine the poet Beck, he was a night editor, probably wrote this at night, sort of leaning back on his chair and concluding the poem, because this is wartime. This is why our lads are still fighting. And this is going to be tomorrow, Friday's Shabbat paper. And people are going to read this and talk about it at Shabbat dinners. He needs a conclusion. You said, well, Rabbi, like a sermon a message to take home, to talk about with the kids. The war of the people who stood without fear against seven armies, the kings of the East, will not fear saying also, tell it not in gut. It is quite cowardly. It's not quite cowardly as this. If we were strong enough to face the seven armies of the enemy. We shouldn't be afraid of bringing it out. The expression, tell it not a gut, comes from David's lamentation over Shaul and his friends when he wants to cover the shame of losing the war. And he says, tell it not in gut. Gut was the enemy's capital, the Philistine capital, gut. And he doesn't want the enemy to know of our shame. And Altaman says, I don't care. If we are strong enough to fight, we should be strong enough to entertain critique. And it is needed. It doesn't make us less strong. On the contrary, it makes us that much stronger. And now the question arises, ladies and gentlemen, if you are the head of the state, the prime minister, the minister of defense, the boss of Altaman, your national poet brought out this shame in the daily paper of your own party. What do you do? What would be Ben-Gurion's reaction? And I'm willing to take bets if there are any. Anybody would like to guess? You can unmute if you want to make a guess if you're in the Zoom with us. Nobody? Rabbi, I'm not asking you because I know that we have done this together more than once. I think that he may not have been so happy. He mm -hmm. was, um, he certainly had his own positions about the war. He also had his own personality, Ben Gurion, and, and he was his boss. And I'm sure that this hit him very hard. And um, I'm sure he responded. <laughs> Okay, so Aline, yeah. Aline, yeah. 
I'm going to ask you to read the Ben-Gurion response. Here it is on the screen, will you? Sure, hang on. Dear Alteron, you sharp for the moral authority and the strength of expression in your last column in Devar. You became the mouthpiece, a pure and true mouth to human conscience. If this conscience will not act and reverberate in our hearts in these days, we shall not be worthy of the great things we got so far. I am asking your permission uh, to print this column. No armored column in our arsenal can surpass it for fighting might by the publishing house of the Ministry of Defense and distribute it even to every military man in Israel. Very nice, with gratitude and appreciation. Okay. David Ben-Gurion, I think that's really very, that's very strong and moral on his part. 100,000 copies were published two days later of the poem and distributed to the military, to civilians working with the military and to anybody uh, that wanted a copy of the poem. And Alterman himself had instructed that whenever in books, his poem, The Silver Platter, glorifying our war and victory as we have studied last time was to be published. Alzot needs to be published on the facing page. We need to be able to entertain these two notions together. We need to be strong enough to be proud of our military when they do that which needs to be and to reprimand when it is called for and to call a war crime by its name. Okay, and this concludes my comments for today when Rabbi Jessica and I have chosen the poems to be taught, we know nothing of what will happen on the days that we are studying it. Yes, Aline, <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, this, was, this has just been fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm, you know, I think most of us are well aware, I certainly am, about the status of the National Poet Laureates and, and Israel and how much they place on poetry and on writing and on things, as opposed to the United States, um, that does not. What was, were all of Alterman's, um, were all of his columns every week a poem? Oh yeah, 700 of them for 30 years. Okay, I just didn't know if he always wrote in poetry is edit is gone. Yeah, but this is just part of his poetry. No, I understand that, but there I just didn't know. Yeah, he had other writings too, though. That's what she's Many. at. He he was a journalist as books, well. And, and yeah. five books of lyrical, beautiful poetry that is personal, that has nothing to do with the day events, or sometimes, as I will show in my Alterman class. I will show when he publishes this book of love poetry, uh, what is happening in the other part of his life and what is he writing about in the paper at the same time, because it's interesting to say. So we do that as well. But yes, every week for 30 years or more, first in Haaretz and then in Deval. Thank do you. I agree I with all of them? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to resonate with what Rachel said. M May 14th is the secular date of independence. So it's not just that the war is going on, what he's reflecting on the ethics of war, but also that in the timeline of the formation of the state this last week was the secular date mm -hmm. of um, of the declaration. He's he's um, he's prophetic. I, I, I mean, it's I don't know what he was like, like as a human being and as a guy to be around, but Terrible. Um, yeah, that's what <laughs> I think you had said. But but the the depth of his propheticness um, and the wisdom and you know, you think about the prophets speaking, you know, truth to power as they did in the biblical text and what he does and that he is, I think the prophets were rejected by the kings, but embraced by tradition because we read their text, but that the king or the prime minister accepts his um, reflection is, is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, I can't thank you enough. We made it through without an alarm. I hope the rest yeah. of your night is the same. And that it's a calm night. I hope the next week when we speak, we're on a, a better trajectory. Um, and just stay safe and well, Rachel. We can't thank you enough. 
pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very right. much. Later Take all. care. Thank you to uh, Kira and Sharon, who are our producers today as well. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.